Good evening, everyone. My name is Luke Tannen, and I'm the Executive Director of Chicago Innovation, an organization that is celebrating its 20th anniversary year of supporting local innovators and entrepreneurs through a variety of events and programs. And we are also a very proud partner and customer of Wintrust, like many of you in the audience. On behalf of Wintrust, I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's virtual event, a talk with Jerry Reinsdorf and Tom Ricketts, who will be in conversation with the founder and chairman of Wintrust, Ed Wehmer. Now, as we all know, we recently got a new president last week, and one of his key calls to action was a call for unity. Now, Ed, by getting the owners of the Cubs and White Sox both together tonight, I think you've made unity happen in record time. Now, before we bring out our speakers, I have a couple things to point out. First, keep an eye out for a couple polling questions so we can learn more about you, the audience. And second, we've also received many questions from the audience in advance that we'll be incorporating into the discussion so thank you all for already bringing your voice, questions, and ideas into this evening's event. Now on to our speakers. First, I will start with Ed, founder and chairman of Wintrust. So Wintrust started in 1991 over a card table and some beer uh, and cigars and a phone the size of a brick, as Ed likes to say. And the bank today is as strong as ever. Now I've gotten to know Ed the past eight or nine years or so ever since Wintrust became a sponsor of Chicago Innovation. And through Ed's leadership, Wintrust continues to be a great ally for us, and most importantly, the Chicago region. And what I personally love about Ed's mindset is that he doesn't pick sides. Wintrust is indeed Chicago's bank. That includes Northside Cubs fans, Southside Sox fans, and everybody else in between. Next, moving on to Jerry Reinsdorf. Jerry began his 40th season as chairman of the Chicago White Sox in 2020, becoming only the seventh person in Major League Baseball history to reach the 40-year milestone as a club owner. But during his tenure, the White Sox have won four AL division titles and a World Series title. Jerry is also the owner of the Chicago Bulls, and as Bulls chairman, he has brought home six NBA championships to the city. He's been responsible for the construction of four new sports facilities, including the new Comiskey Park and the United Center. And, you know, beyond the championships and, and the stadiums, he's been involved in extensive community service, donating millions of dollars uh, to local causes. Joining him this evening is Tom Ricketts. Tom is the executive chairman of the Chicago Cubs. When Tom and his family were introduced as the new owners of the Cubs, Tom outlined three goals for the organization. First, win the World Series. Second, preserve and improve Wrigley Field. And third, be a good neighbor. Since then, Tom and his siblings have dedicated themselves to building a world-class organization both on and off the field. And that includes major investments made in their facilities, team, front office talent, and the Chicago community, as well as bringing home a World Series title in 2016, ending a 108-year drought. So thanks to Jerry and Tom, Chicago is indeed one of the best sports cities in the world, and the impact they've made in our communities will continue to be felt for generations to come. What an honor and privilege it is to introduce all of our speakers this evening, Ed Wehmer, Jerry Reinsdorf, and Tom Ricketts. Take it away, Ed. Thank you, sir. Welcome, welcome to everybody in the audience. This ought to be a very interesting evening, to say the least. Um, I can't believe you brought politics into it, for God's sakes. It's anything but politics these days would be great. Um, I'd like to uh, thank both Tom and uh, Jerry for joining me here tonight. As you know, we're our, they're great partners of Wintrust. Um, when, we, when we made the decision to kind of go big or go home, um, we decided to align ourselves with every uh, major uh, iconic team or uh, whatever in Chicago. First thing we went to was the Cubs and the White Sox. Been partners with them forever. They're what, baseball people are the best. They're absolutely wonderful people. I couldn't be prouder to have both of you here tonight. Thanks for joining us. I can't see you guys. You on? Oh, um, yeah. Here we All are. Right. Good. Um, so I thought I'd start with the $64,000 um, question. Are we going to be able to go to ball games this year or what? <laughs> I don't know which one he wants to take that. Yeah, Tom, why don't you answer that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think our answers will be the same. Um, <laughs> I think it's a work in progress. I, I mean, I, uh, I know that all the teams, uh, you know, are, are, you know, Jerry's club and, and, and mine as well are, are in conversations with the city. And I think there, there's, um, I mean, there, there's no, there's no definitive ruling on what's going to happen when everyone's just in conversation. They're watching all the, the information that's coming across, kind of seeing how things go. 
Uh, I'm pretty confident that at some point we'll have people in the ballpark, but how many and when, um, there's still just too many variables to say. The, uh, you think they're going to uh, prioritize baseball players as uh, up in the, um, the vaccine ranks or what? No, not at all. I mean, uh, I, I think no, nobody wants to be involved in jumping the line. Ball players are going to wait until uh, it get, you know, protocols allow people of their ages to get vaccinated. Hmm. I would gladly, I, I, if I already had mine, I would gladly donated my position in line to get back to the ball game. That's for sure. Um, um, it had to be tough last year uh, financially to not have everybody in the park. <laughs> How, yeah, how, are, how, how are Major League Sports dealing with this? Because everybody's got to deal with it. And I guess TV, TV revenue is one way, but it's the only way right now. Well, the, you know, the industry, baseball industry lost, you know, somewhere between two and a half and three billion dollars in the aggregate. Uh, some teams, you know, had an easier time handling it than, than others, but it was, a, it was a huge loss. And heaven knows what the loss is going to be this year. You know, because even if we, even when we do have people in the stands, it's not likely to be a full house. It's likely to start out something like twenty five percent. So it, it, it's it's going to be another tough year. Yeah, and I mean, baseball. Yeah, and baseball really uh, got it worse than other sports last year. I think first of all, the timing, as as you might recall, the the shutdown happened or the sports shutdown happened as we were just about to start our season. So obviously, we had. Um, you know, incurred a lot of the expenses to get everything uh, up and running and, and get the season going. And, um, and then the second thing about baseball is we just get a lot more of our revenue from in-game attendance. You know, the, uh, you know, as a percentage of our, of our income, we get a lot more from uh, tickets, parking, and, and everything that happens at the ballpark than, say, an NFL team. And then, you know, lastly, I, you know, like I said, this started in March, you know, you know, uh, basketball and hockey at least were able to get a good part of their regular season in before the before the, the COVID shutdown, whereas baseball it was tough. And so, as we um, as we eventually ground our way toward the sixty game season that we had with no fans, um, that was uh, you know that was it was financially very difficult because obviously we had no revenue to cover the cost to pay the players on those sixty games. So um, as Jerry points out, it doesn't look great for this year either. Um, hopefully we'll have more, more, um, more people in the park to offset some of our costs. Yeah. I, you know, I think it, it, eventually they've got to give in. I mean, it's getting kind of crazy out there. Don't you think I, this whole thing is, anyhow, a lot of megalomaniacs out there telling you what to do. They love the power. You both re have relatively new managers. Well, um, Jerry, you've got a very, a brand new one who's, uh, not new to you, but, uh, uh, new, new at the White Sox currently, and Tom, you you have uh, you've got one too, just a year under his belt, maybe a half year under his belt. It's kind of interesting that one's old, one's young, but they both handled pitchers. One was a catcher, I think, and Tony was a catcher too, wasn't he? No, Tony was a backup infielder. Okay. Um, he played for the he played for the Cubs, you know. He never played for the White Sox. He actually played for the Cubs. Did really? He? Yeah, I, I, think he, I, I think he went two for seven. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be worth about seven billion bucks these days, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, can you, you know, it's kind of a dichotomy, but um, they both, uh, they're both very effervescent guys. Well, what, what, um, what do you think of that? I'm not sure what you mean. I, obviously, we both think that they're going to be pretty good or we wouldn't have hired them. Uh, but yeah. you know, in, to in Tony's case, you know, he's a Hall of Fame manager. Uh, so sometime this year, he will pass John McGraw to become the winningest manager in the history of baseball, except for Connie Mack, who owned the team and couldn't be fired. So, <laughs> <laughs> so really, he will be the winningest manager. Mack has won the most games of any manager, but he lost more than he won. Uh, you know, there was a lot of criticism. A lot of the media jumped all over us for hiring a guy that's 76 years old. I actually think 76 is pretty young. I wish I were <laughs> back to 76. But, he, but he, he's full of energy. He's loaded with energy. He's ready to go. And the, the big reason that we brought him back was we thought we were going to be pretty good this year. 
but we really wanted a manager who knew how to handle pitching. And that's, that's you know, the strongest uh, aspect of Tony's managing ability. You had said that. I found it interesting that you have somebody who can handle pitching really well. And Tom, you, you've got uh, Grandpa Rossi, who was a catcher and certainly mm -hmm. could handle pitchers. Um, do you feel the same way in terms of managing? Uh, the, the, the managing pitch? You can have a bench coach do a lot of the work and for everybody else, but pitchers are a different breed. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, David Ross made it through his major league career mainly as a defensive catcher. In fact, um, you know, we when John Lester signed with the team, we had dinner. And one of the things John Lester suggested, or it was before he signed, he said, you know, I don't want to be the only old guy on the team. Now, he was <laughs> like 29 or something at the time. <laughs> but what he was getting at was he wanted to see if we, we would sign David Ross as well. So I, he went down this I'm the only old guy thing. And then he left and I turned to Theo. I'm like, what was that all about? And he said, well, we're, we're looking at, uh, you know, um, bringing in David Ross. David Ross caught John in, in Boston. You know, he's highly regarded defensive catcher. And I'm like, oh, is he right-handed or left-handed? And Theo just said, eh, he's no-handed. So don't <laughs> but he, uh, so um, no, he, we're happy to have Rossi. He's, uh, you know, um, he's even before, even before he came to the Cubs, it was, he was one of those guys that, it goes around in the league like he's manager of potential and um and then we saw his leadership on some of our some of our better teams and and uh when he when he retired we made sure we kept him in the organization and then when the time was right we brought him to be manager and i thought he did a great job last year and i think he's a future hall of famer hopefully i don't know if he'll catch la russa uh but yeah. uh, he'll be a good one yeah well it's kind of fun to think that um that uh, we've got two really good teams in Chicago. They're going to, they may vie for, uh, both made the playoffs last year. And you could be, maybe we get that Subway Series in, you never know. Um, the rebuild question, you know, are you rebuilding? You're not rebuilding. The White Sox with the tail end of rebuilding and going in with a very strong young team. Um, Tom, you're kind of semi rebuilding. It's, it's kind of a constant cycle, isn't it? Where, you have to rebuild all the time just based on free agency. I know that when, when Theo first came and Jed first came, I saw their presentation on players and how old they are and where, where you want to get a player and to one age and et cetera, et cetera. And you had that graph where you get 29, you're over the hill or whatever. He's an outfielder. And I know Jerry said once that if you had two injuries and he's going to get rid of you. He told me that once. <laughs> Barry would have lasted maybe a week with you, <laughs> but um, uh, is that is it is that the way it's going to be in sports with the salaries and the taxes and free agency? Is you're gonna you're gonna boom or bust in terms of build a team, have a couple three four year good years, and start over? Well, you know the way the systems in all sports work is they're designed to prevent people from having dynasties. The, the, the leagues want everybody to have a chance to win at some point in time, and so. When, when you do win, you get lousy draft choices, and it's mm -hmm. and, and and also you run, you run your payroll up, and it, it's just hard to stay on top. It, 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 it's not hard to stay in the middle. It's not hard to stay in the middle. You can be mediocre for a long time if you want, I, you know. But I, I'd rather be bad for a while and then get good for a while than be mediocre forever. Yeah, and I, um, I just add to Jerry's comment, like. The way that uh, the way that amateur talent is distributed in baseball isn't just by record. Teams from uh, smaller demographic areas get yeah. extra picks and they get preference. So, and if we lose a uh, a player to free agency, the, the draft pick we get would be a, a draft pick that's much lower than what anyone else in our division would get. Our divisions would get. So it's really hard to get um, to keep restocking your your system if you're a, a larger market club and, and, and obviously both uh, us and the White Sox count as that. So, so it's really tough. Um, the way we look at it, like when, when we did it a few years ago with Theo, I, I don't know that when he came in, he really realized just how bad the situation was from our ability to, to, uh, to put a good team on the field. And, um, and I think it was after he was there for a little while, he realized, okay, we really do have to kind of take this on down to the, to the bottom before we can bring it back up. We don't really feel like we're there at, at this moment, um, but you do from time to time have to make trades that, that benefit the future team at the cost of the present team. And obviously when, 
when we traded you Darvish this year, which by the way, is this, these are Jed's decisions. I don't, I don't tell him what to do or, or, or like direct him on this stuff, but, but, but it was pretty clear that we, um, we have one of the bottom farm systems. And, and part of the reason is that we've been trading minor league players away to get major league players for about six years in a row, going all the way back to uh, 2015, 2016, trading Dan Vogelbach for Mike Montgomery. We started to always start plugging, taking good future talents for guys that we could use on the big league club. Well, after doing that for five or six years, your farm system just gets depleted. And if you can find a chance, if you find an opening to, um, you know, to trade uh, a current player for, um, you know, for, you know, four or five, and, you know, four relatively good prospects, sometimes you just have to do that. But, but we do see ourselves being more, we're trying to be more consistent and hopefully not like Jerry points out, it's not hard to be mediocre forever, but we'd like to be more, you know, we'd like to copy what the Cardinals do and just, they're always kind of around and they're every year they, they, they have a chance. And, and uh, that's kind of where we want to be at this point. How the Cardinals do it. I asked somebody that once and he said, well, you just got better players. I said, well, thanks. I get that. But how do they do it year in and year out? And for a long time, they had a great manager. That might've been part of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are the farm teams coming? I, how, I, I haven't looked at how they're ranked and how are the, how's the White Sox farm system and how's yours, Tom? Uh, I think, I think generally the, you know, kind of the, uh, the baseball Americas and the people that rank farm systems, um, we're, we're pretty low. I think we're in the bottom third. Um, you know, we do have, I mean, but it's, it's kind of a weird thing to rank. Like ultimately, you mean averaging out all the players in your system? Is that what they're doing? Or are they seeing you have three or four really high, high ceiling prospects? I mean, how they, how they judge it is a little, a little weird, but um, I think that, uh, you know, after trading the, like the trade we made uh, for Quintana to the White Sox with losing a couple of our top, top prospects to, uh, to Jerry's team, um, other trades we made, you know, to get Chapman, um, other guys that we picked up over the, over the last few years. And we've traded most of those, high profile prospects. So that typically pushes your, your farm system ratings down. But I think that um, after the trade we just did with the Padres, that'll, that'll pop. We, um, we had one of the more highly regarded players in this year's international draft out of, out of Dominican. That'll, that'll help us over the next couple of years. So we're, we're rebuilding there, um, but hopefully we can keep improving the farm system with talent and with development um, and, and developing them the right way while we're maintaining our ability to compete for our division. Jerry, how about you? I think our farm system is still in pretty good shape. Uh, you know, I, I don't put much uh, credibility on these rankings. I mean, who, who's doing the rankings? Uh, uh, writers? Uh, they, they certainly aren't skilled enough to do it. So I think they, you know, they get on the phone, they talk to scouts and people from other organizations and they put a lot of stock in rankings, but, and, and the, the fact of the matter is, if you have two players on every one of your farm teams that's going to actually make it up and be a regular in the big leagues, you're pretty lucky. Uh, Eddie Ion used to say that we pay 23 guys to play catch with the two guys that are going to be big leaguers. It's, it's, it's a very, very inefficient system. Uh, but, you know, we've, uh, I think we're pretty, we, we still, by our own estimation, have some good young players that will be coming in the next couple of years. That's great. Uh, how about pitching this year, both starting and bullpen? How do you feel about your pitching staffs? Well, you know, for one thing, you know, uh, we're, we're getting lots of kudos for having won the winter. The last time I checked, there were no trophies given out for winning the winter. Uh, in fact, we won, we won the winter before <laughs> and didn't do well. And uh, a number of years back, Sports Illustrated had the Cleveland Indians undercover and predicted they'd win a World Series and they finished last. So uh, expectations – don't mean anything. You know, we, we think we're in good shape. We think we're going to have a solid team. We think we're going to compete, but you got to play the games. The games have to be played. People get hurt. Sometimes people don't, you know, have bad years. Base, baseball is such a, uh, a mental game. You never know what kind of a year a guy's going to have until you see him have, having it. You know, I don't think there's any other sport where, it's, where there's such a variation from year to year in the performance of players. A guy can hit 321 year, 220 the next year, and 290 the next year, and it's not, you know, it's not unusual, but we think we're going to be good. We th and we think we're going to compete. And uh, and I think the Cubs are going to compete. I don't know. I, I see a lot of the media writing the Cubs off. 
I, I, I think they've got a really good chance to win that division. So do I. I think you both do. Who do you think you, who's going to be your starting four, Jerry? Or five? Well, uh, uh, Giolito, Keiko, uh, uh, Lance Lynn, uh, then uh, Dylan Cease probably, and there'll be some competition for the fifth spot. Mm -hmm. How about the bullpen? And, bullpen looks pretty good. I mean, we got, you know, we, we, we got a, a guy who was a great closer the last two years. Let's see if he's a great closer <laughs> another year. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, but, but we've got, we, we really have what, on pay again, it's all on paper. It looks like a strong bullpen with Bomber and, and Marshall and uh, 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 Matt, Matt uh, whatever, and, and Hoyer. It looks strong, but, but I've been around this game so long, not only as, as an owner, but also as a fan. I and mean, I've been watching baseball since uh, before Tom was born. I mean, I went to my first game in 1946. And the one thing I know about baseball is, you, you, is that you never know enough. If you think you figured it out, then there's something wrong with you. And I you just can't make predictions. But, you know, you, you try to go out and do the best you can. Uh, and again, I say on paper, it looks good. But you, you, the game's not playing on paper. That's the fun part of it, though. That's what makes that what make opening day fun. Go out and see what you got. I know. And if you lose the first two games of the year, you think you're never going to win again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love you, that. Tom? Yeah, I, I, I agree. Like, it's funny. Like, you start the season and everyone has <laughs> Then you're three and five, and the world is collapsing. <laughs> uh -huh. um, no, we'll be, we'll be, we'll do good pitching. Obviously, we, uh, you know, Darvish was our best starter last year, and, and, and we let him go for some young talent. But we got back uh, Zach Davies, who's actually had like a 270 ERA last year and has, has been a brewer for a while and has always tortured us. So um, he'll be a nice replacement for, uh, for you in the lineup, and then Kyle Hendricks. So then we've got a lot of guys, some young guys and some established guys that are going to be working working to get those last starting spots. And then we also have some uh, time before camps break so, or we go to camp so we can uh, add some people. And I know Jed's had a lot of conversations along those lines. How about two no hitters last year? One for the Cubs, one for the Sox. You think, uh, think your guy's going to be okay, Tom? He's going to, he's got quite a story behind him. I, everybody roots for him. Yeah. I think that the, um, the sad part for, you know, for some hit, throwing a no hitter, like nobody's in the ballpark. Like, you know, you know, the, uh, like you, you're it just, I mean, you're watching that game and it, it's build it's building toward the ninth inning and, you know, it's pretty exciting. And, and, uh, you know, um, I think Alec Mills is like just you dealing and, and then the, um, uh, you know, but you know, there's nobody there. Like, and, and it, it was in, so like, it was in, I mean, Milwaukee is, as you guys know, like that's like half Cub fans on the afternoon. So it would have been really exciting to uh, to um, to see him deliver with in front of the crowds, but uh, maybe maybe I'll get one this year too. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be awesome. Now you mentioned sports writers. I find them to be terrible. In other words, they 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 are really tough on every sports team in Chicago. Um, I don't think anyone ever, ever had a jock strap themselves. To be honest with you, would put on their head if they they, they get one they know what to do with it. Um, you, do you believe that? I mean, the same thing. I, you, they're just always so negative. They drive me nuts. Uh, I know you don't want well, to say anything bad about your media, but I guess I can. <laughs> well, it's, it's not as bad as it was. We had a guy named Jay Mariotti who was here for a number of years, and he was brutal on everybody, uh, every single team. Uh, and, and we've had some other writers who were, who were pretty bad. Uh, look, if they want to be negative, they can be negative. Uh, I don't think it affects. I don't think it affects anything. I, I, the only thing that, that that I ask of of the writers and the people on the, on the radio and the talk shows is get your facts straight. You know, don't 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 make stuff up. Don't 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 go for rumors that's, that somebody's made up. Check your facts out, and then re, you know, report the truth. Report the facts. Yeah, and I would. The only thing I would add to that is, uh, I mean, there are times, and I'm not really worried. I mean, necessarily about what they say about me, but like the, like it gets so personal. Like, uh, you know, in the end, you know, everyone's doing their best, making good decisions. And, you know, obviously, like, um, you know, the designated owner, the owner has to be the one that, that takes the heat when the team has a bad year. And, and honestly, you'd probably rather have it that way than one of your people getting, getting, more, uh, getting more negative press or, or getting more heat. But, um, 
but you know, like it's, it's, um, uh, there are some writers where it's just a, it's just a lifestyle decision for them to, to hate ownership. And that's just what they write about every day. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and you just can't, you can't do a whole lot about it. And, um, but you know, there's also a lot of good writers out there too. I mean, the, the, uh, there's a lot of good writers on like different, different blogs and different things that actually work to get, um, get their facts straight. And, and so, um, and people are getting their information from so many different sources these days. Yeah. Uh, I think the one thing that, you know, the, the one thing that's changed even in the last few years, just the, the social media aspect where everything that gets posted gets 50 anonymous negative comments right away, almost no matter what it is. So um, I think, I don't think that's all that great for fans because we have a lot of, we have a lot of chat rooms or blogs that people like to go to and, and, um, and they get kind of taken over by, you know, just one or two people or three people who just want to put as much negative stuff in as they can. And yeah, I, you know, the, I don't think that- the, the, Go ahead. No, go ahead, Tom. No, I was saying, I don't think that helps the dialogue. I think, I think the vast majority of people, you know, they, they want to talk about the positive things. They want to talk about the, the things that they like about their club. They want to, they want to be optimistic. They want to look forward to the season. Um, uh, you know, I think I think some of those places just gets gets hijacked by the um, by you know by, by by certain people who just want to make it as negative as possible. That's society now. That's the way everything works. Yeah. Well, you know, it's really changed over the years, though. Is when the primary uh, source for news was the newspapers, uh, there were, there was an adult su supervision. You had editors that that that, that the writers are responsible to. With social media, there's there no adult supervision. Just put out there anything you want to put out there and. Uh, it doesn't have to be right at all. Just the, you want, uh, and the key is to be first. Be first. And you don't have mm -hmm. to be accurate. But you know that's just something we have to live with. You know, I know people who are involved in, in politics, people involved in various business, people involved in sports, and none of us like the media. <laughs> so yeah. it's not just sports. With you on that, um, why don't we take our first uh, poll question for the audience? You guys there? Do I get to vote? Sure. Yeah. I got both. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. All right. Let's submit. To each of you, I guess, uh, what what is the hardest part of being a base of owning a sports team? Jerry, you have two. What's the hardest part? <laughs> well, I think we've already talked about the hardest part. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's the media. Um, no, the hardest, the hardest part is to make decisions without regard to what people are going to think about those decisions. You've got to do what you think makes the most sense at the time. You've got more information than anybody else. If, if your decision is popular, but turns out to be wrong. People are going to forget that they liked it when you made it. If your decision is uh, uh, is a bad one, turns uh, is not popular. Turns out to be a good one. People will forget they didn't like it when you made it. So you you, you just can't uh, uh, you just can't worry about what people are going to think. You have to do what you think is best and be judged on the results. I know uh, the first year I got into baseball, Jimmy Pearsall said to me, "If you uh, listen to the fans, you'll soon be sitting with the fans." And I think that's probably <laughs> <laughs> probably pretty accurate so we've we've got to make decisions that we think are correct take the heat if they're if they're not popular and just hope they work out mm -hmm. what do you think tom yeah I, I mean i agree i i always say to our guys if we win we're smart if we lose we're dumb everything else is noise like mm -hmm. um you can't control you have to try to uh, do what you think is right to keep the train on the tracks and keep moving forward and um and like Jerry said, you know, if you make a good decision that fails, no one's going to come back and say, yeah, well, that sucked. But, but yeah, that was a great idea when you did it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, like, uh, so you just have to play through and, uh, you know, and I think, um, I think one of the things that, that, uh, that for both of us on the phone, both Jerry and myself, like having good people that you trust, that you've been with for a long time, that, 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 you know, make good decisions on your behalf. Like, you know, cause it's not like we get in there and, you know, pick which guy to trade for, which free agent to sign or anything like that. You get, you get people that you trust. And then when they make, when they come to you with their, you know, their, 
their best, you know, their best answer for how to prepare a team for the season, you support it. And if you trust, if you trust your people, then you're always, then you sleep well at night and you're always comfortable. Um, and so that's, you know, I think the way that, the way you kind of get around the, uh, you know, the, 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 the drama of ownership. It's just like going to any other business. I mean, our, our, our mantra is over the top. It's leave your ego at the door at Wintrust. That's number one. And then we say, take the blame, share the fame, avoid the shame and enjoy the game. That's how, and so you guys could run a bank if you wanted to. <laughs> so I switch jobs, anybody? I'd love to run a baseball. They'd be fun for about a year. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do I got here now? Uh, how about the rule changes? You guys, you like them? You don't like them? I don't know anybody wants to get through the game faster. Uh, I think you should serve beer longer and make the game longer. That's my opinion, but what do I know? Well, I, I think pace of the game is more important than length of the game. Uh, and and the, the, the pace has really slowed up. I mean, in my mind, too many strikeouts, too many home runs, too many walks. We, we, we've got to make the game you know, more exciting again. And, uh, and it can be done. It can be done. Do you yeah. think, uh, is the ball juiced or not? What do you think? No, I don't think it's juiced. I think, uh, there, I think there are more home runs because somebody came up with the idea that you should try to hit more home runs. So instead of swinging level, trying to hit hard ground balls or line drives, you have more players, you know, uh, with what they call the launch angle, where, they, where they're, they're hitting uphill. And that results in, in more home runs, but it also results in more strikeouts. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think that'll change. I mean, I, you know, over, over all the years that baseball has been around, things change. Stolen base was popular, then stolen base wasn't popular. Now it may come back again. And so I, I, I think uh, uh, that the, uh, the, the idea of trying to hit home runs and, and not caring about strikeouts is going to pass at some point. It would probably help if we took that, that uh, second baseman out of right field and made, a, made all the infielders play on the dirt. Because uh, particular, for some reason, it, it's with the left-hand hitters. Uh, they, uh, they, they tend to be more pull hitters. And it's frustrating when a guy hits a line drive to right field and there's a second baseman there. So he says, the hell with it. I'm going to try to hit over his head and hit home runs. We brought the second baseman and that might change things a little bit. I, I don't know why they don't bunt down the third baseline. Just to get on. <laughs> I mean, even I could run that out. Of thing. <laughs> guys, guys don't like to do it. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, we ask ourselves that all the time. Guys, they don't like to bunt. Uh, they, don't, they don't feel they're good at it. Uh, they'll, they'll do it once a month to keep their manager off their back. But, uh, but I, 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 I concur with Jerry on, on the, um, on the pace of the game. I think the other thing that, um, and, and a corollary to that is just more action, you know, obviously strikes, uh, strikeouts, walks and homers, um, you know, it, you know, there's, they're going up every single year. We need more balls in play. Like if you remember, I think it was game five of the uh, world series last year where uh, the Dodger, it was Taylor, the center fielder overran the ball and there was an exciting play at the plate. Like baseball used to finish a lot of games that way. And now it's, 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 mm -hmm. you know, you finishes on a three run homer. And, uh, or, you know, so I think what we have to do is uh, figure out a way to get more balls in play. I also agree that uh, I think it would improve the game to, uh, to limit the shift, keep two guys on either side of second base, maybe keep all your infielders on the, on the dirt. And I think it would also, um, lead to some more defensive plays. I might see some more defensive second baseman or, um, you know, just more infielders making great plays on mm -hmm. um, they're trying to get through the infield. And that might, you know, that just might just, uh, just, just make the game a little more exciting. And, but we have to look at all those things and, and hopefully we'll get some of those changes soon. Yeah, it is. It's, it brings the strategy back into baseball. I mean, kind of gone out here. It's walk home run or strike out. I mean, it's kind of boring. Get a guy on base. You bunt him over. Do you steal? What do you do? Um, it was it was always the strategy was always a lot of fun to watch, and uh, you don't have that anymore because it's all. I mean, when when Schwarber would get up there and he wouldn't bunt, he did every now and then. But it's like, oh, just get out of here. Your numbers be great. Yeah, eventually they'll, I, eventually they'll move back on you. I mean, that's what you got to do. Well, I think I think with Tony managing the White Sox this year, you're going to see more hit and running, <laughs> more st more stolen bases. 
more more the batters trying to beat the shift by going the other way. At least that's what he's promised me. So we'll let, let, let's see if he can deliver. Well, you think the ball players themselves would want to do it. Going the other way is is so um, it's so cool when guys do that. It's uh, well, it is. It, the it, agents the agents tell them that the big money goes to the home run hitters. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, what about the uh, the the bullpen and the uh, three batter minimum? You like that or not? I don't. I I, I don't like the three batter. I, I I wanted to try two batters. Uh, I, I thought three was a little bit too much. Uh, but uh, because it, you, you bring a guy in, he, he puts two men on, he obviously doesn't have it, and you get and you, and you have to let him, you know, pitch to that third guy. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I think we should have tried two before we went to three. How about you, Tom? Yeah, I've, I've been comfortable with three because it's really three or finish the inning. Um, and uh, and I think I agree with the principle that we had to do something for the for the specialists, <laughs> you know. And you have a great left-handed hitter you know, like, like Rizzo or some, you know, someone who is a, a good left-handed here, you, you wouldn't see, they wouldn't see a, a right-handed pitcher after the fifth inning, you know, as people have gotten better um, at using their bullpens and bullpens have gotten better. You know, you see, you know, remember it wasn't too long ago where if someone had a guy that threw 95 miles an hour in a bullpen, that was a special, that was a special, <laughs> t- oh, that's, that's like the low end. Everybody's yeah. you know, going so hard and, and, um, and I think teams have gotten much more effective at using their relievers and understanding the situations. And I think baseball development technology has supported improved pitching over the last few years, you know, with, with all the cameras and different ways that, they, that they, they work on their grips and the way they work on their pitches. It's just getting so hard to hit late in the game. And um, I think it was a good idea to, to try to shake something up just to have a little more action, you know, toward the, toward the later innings. Yeah. Uh, you know, you think, look at a guy like Hendricks. He's a throwback. I mean, I don't think you could throw the ball through a, three pieces of paper at his speed, but, man, it gets guys out. Mm-hmm. It's nice. Tom, this one's for you. What, what are you going to miss most about Theo? Uh, that's a great question. Now, you know, I mean, first of all, it's like it, it isn't like the, the hardest breakup of all time because Jed just kind of steps right in, and he was in all of our yeah. conversations for the last – the last nine years. So um, the transition isn't nearly as, as dramatic as it would be if we uh, you know, had a whole new staff or a whole new group there. Um, but, you know, one thing I always respected about Theo, like every time we had, we talked almost every day and you really get to know your, your baseball guys. And um, every time we had a conversation, he, he had, an, you know, generally had an answer for every one of our issues and he had a lot of reasoning behind it. I mean, uh, he never just threw up his hands and said, Oh, that's just baseball. It just happens sometimes, <laughs> you know, and there are guys who do that. And so like, um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, as well as his personal friend, uh, I think that is something that, uh, that, that everybody wants to have in their GM or president of baseball operations, whatever the title is. Um, and, uh, you know, and he was great at it, but, but our transition to jet will be pretty seamless. Yeah. I remember when we were flying on a plane that time, and we got, uh, it was a long flight. We got done talking and he brought a book about this big with like bar paper out, you know, the old, uh, with the, with the tracks on the side, just going through numbers. It's like, Oh my God. It's like, he's reading a phone book, but I guess he got his stuff out of it. Yeah. You know, Theo it definitely was one of the uh, earlier general managers to um, be more thoughtful about how they use analytics and statistics to make better in game decisions and better player personnel decisions. But I think that um, where, where he's undersold is, I mean, first of all, he was a literature major. It wasn't like he was a, you know, like a, uh, <laughs> it wasn't like a stat guy initially, um, but he just understood them. But what, um, what I think he really was great at is he just, he, he was a very good manager of people. Um, all the players respected him. He was always very honest with players. You know, when yeah. you send a player down, that can be a really tough conversation. If you go in and say, hey, well, we, we love you, but we just need the spot. You know, they don't, what do they learn? You know, and, uh, but Theo would go in and say, Hey, look, you're, you're striking out way too much. And until you learn to stay back on that slider, you got to go to Iowa or something like that. So, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, I mean, he, Theo gets a lot of credit and he, and he's certainly going to be in the hall of fame someday, but I think people see him a little more quantitatively and they don't know all of his qualitative sides. Are you going to stay in Chicago with his new gig or what? 
Yeah, he, he's, he's living in Chicago. He, he, I think he's planning on staying here for a while. So. Yeah, he's got to get the, the young blonde head kid, the, the little golfer. <laughs> yeah, he's got to hit the ball, did not he? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Jerry, let's let's turn to basketball real quick. The last dance. Were you, uh, or was, was that right? The last, were you, at, were you at, ac accurately portrayed in that? Well, I would say the last dance was based on a true story. <laughs> <laughs> and where, where it really got off track, it, I'm glad they did it because it, it, I, I think it, it's put to rest anybody's thought that there was a better player than Michael Jordan in the history of the game. You really got to see what he could do. But where they got off track was on the so-called breaking up of the team. Because mm -hmm. after we won the sixth championship uh, in 1998, there was a work stoppage. Uh, Phil Jackson announced he was going to retire. Michael Jordan said that uh, he wouldn't play for anybody else other than Phil Jackson. So I had a meeting with Michael and, 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 and said to look, don't, don't announce anything now. Let's wait till the work stoppage is over. Maybe I can talk Phil into coming back. Well, when the work stoppage ended, I tried to get Phil to come back. He still didn't want to coach anymore. But more significantly was during the work stoppage, Michael Jordan was screwing around with a cigar cutter, cut one of his fingers, cut it and had to have surgery. He could not have played that year. That's, that's what really ended the, the so-called dynasty. It was that Phil wouldn't coach and Michael couldn't play. And it didn't fit the narrative that they wanted in the last dance. So they left mm. it out. You think they portrayed you well? Yeah, I have no complaints. If they made a movie on it, who would play you? Oh, Robert Redford, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't think they were fair to Jerry Krause. I think they were very unfair to Jerry Krause. Uh, made him look like a real bad guy. I mean, Jerry was a, a, a terrific basketball guy. He, did he have his foibles? Yeah, he didn't have a great personality. But they made, they made him look far worse than he really was. And after yeah. all, he's the guy that built those championship teams. I mean, when we, when we got when we got the team, Michael was here, but there was no other, there was nobody else, and he built that first three P team. And then when Michael went to baseball, he completely remade the team. So on the second three P team, the only two players who were carryovers were Michael and Scotty. He said mm -hmm. everybody else was brand new. So he brought in a whole bunch of players to win two sets of championships, and they never gave him credit for it. Um, what do we got here? You know, I thought it'd be kind of interesting. We got about 10 minutes left. Uh, we could do the second poll question if you want to do that. Absolutely. Good to see the results in that one. I thought it might be interesting if you ask each, each of you ask each other a question. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't think that's ever happened. This would be kind of cool, I think. So let's, let's take a run at it. Hey, Jerry, can I have yeah. Eloy Jimenez back? <laughs> I didn't hear you. <laughs> can I have Eloy Jimenez back? <laughs> uh, everything has a price. <laughs> 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 oh, look at that. Only 26%. Huh. You know, I, maybe I'd give you Eloy back if we could get the, uh, Tatis Jr. back from the Padres. Oh, <laughs> you, know, the, 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 you know, the only the only way not to make a bad trade is not to make any trades at all. And, uh, you know, and, and when you made that trade, it was just illustrative of what you're talking about before. You were going for a championship. And yeah. you, have, you have to pay up. We did that when we were going for championships before. We, we, we traded Tatis Jr. We knew he was going to be a good player, but he was four years down the, down the road. But, you know, four years came awfully fast. And now he's going <laughs> to probably be a top five player. Every time I, I, I see his name, I cringe. So uh, <laughs> no, nobody ever has to be ashamed of making bad deals because it just happens. And, and a lot of the great deals you make are just luck anyway. So, um, <laughs> So I guess Very, the question, I'll, I'll, I'll come up with a question for Tom. Uh, has, as an owner, you know, before you bought the team, 
you were, you know, you're just a guy that was known in business. Now, now you're a public figure. People recognize you wherever you go. Uh, how, how do you like being a public figure? Um, yeah, actually, I got to admit, like, uh, and Jerry, I remember talking to you about this when we were buying the team. And, um, and uh, you know, the fact is, like, most people have just been really respectful. Uh, I, I, I enjoy talking to people at the ballpark. You know, the uh, you know, I, part of the reason I don't, you know, spend so much time worrying about what, hap- what people say in the media is because you go to the games and you talk to the actual fans and you realize that, you know, they, they're not they're not believing that or they're not freaking out. They just want to be there and they think you're doing what you can to make the team better. Um, I think the only time it ever like has become uncomfortable to be public is in the, you know, the political stuff, which I, you know, I'm not as active. My, my siblings are very active in politics, both sides of the aisle. And, um, you know, and I try to keep the team out of it, but it just is, I mean, this past year with all the, you know, with all the extra emotion or drama around the elections, it's just impossible. Um, and so I think that's the only, the only real negative of the public figure part that I would say. Um, I don't know. How about you, Jerry? What, how, how you, how, I mean, how have you enjoyed it? Well, I would rather not be recognized, <laughs> but <laughs> like you, you know, when, when, when I do interact with fans, which is quite often, it's even in the bad years, it's always been positive. The only negative, the only negative stuff that I get from fans is in the mail. Nobody ever comes up yeah. to me and says, you're doing a bad job or you should have done this or that. It's always through the mail. Uh, and I think by and large, the, the, the Chicago fans are great sports fans. They, they love their teams. They, they, they want us to win. But what's most important, I think, to the typical Chicago sports fan is that the team competes hard, plays hard, and leaves it all out on the field and all on the court. And, and I think we have the best fans in the country in, in Chicago. I agree with you on that. They just want to, they want to see effort. They want to be smart, see smart. Yep. Yeah. Play smart. Um, we've got a couple minutes left. I'm going to ask what you think about the uh, sports betting and books and Jerry, you're going to, you're going to uh, open a parlay joint or not? Well, I don't know if I would call it a parlay joint, but <laughs> I, we, we do expect to be involved in the online sports betting. I'm sure I know the Cubs are, and I know many other teams are. Uh, you know, you know, f- f- and, and by the way, that's one way to generate interest in baseball. For years, uh, I think everybody has recognized that a part of the popularity of football is, is the gambling, is the betting. You have so many things you can bet on. And uh, ba- ba- baseball really hasn't been that way. So I think betting coming to baseball uh, online, the key is online. It's not casinos. It's online. I think it's going to be good for the game uh, and, 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 you know, keep people watching the game long after the actual outcome is decided. Mm-hmm. Tom? Yeah, I think there's um, a lot of uh, evidence that, you know, that, that sports gaming drives fan avidity. It gets people more interested in the game. I think, uh, you know, we are, we have a, we've announced we've got a deal with DraftKings to work with us at, uh, at, at Wrigley. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think it's kind of a, uh, you know, it, it's, it was happening already. Like people were, you know, people were doing a lot of, a lot of gambling in any case. And so I think the legalization of it is probably a natural thing. And um, I think it should, should help the game and, and baseball, I think it will help us even more because there's so many discrete events that you can focus on and so many different types of uh, bets you can place. And I think it'll just, make, uh, I think it'll just. Hope we lost you. I see, we, I see Tom. Can't hear him. I, I'm a betting guy. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm a grass, I'm a grass and dirt guy. That's about all I could do is the ball get it up the grass and the dirt between innings. Mound ball? All I bet on. Mound, mound ball. ball. Yeah, that's it. We played for beers. <laughs> a lot of fun. Um, oh, I got, I got a, one more here and then I'll let you guys go. It's just been awesome. Um, How do the players keep it motivated with anybody in the stands? Tom, you reference that, but um, in talking about no hitters and the like, the guy shows a no hitter. His mother isn't even there, for God's sakes. Uh, <laughs> how uh, how do they keep motivated? Um, I think that you know you don't the energy you can feel like in hockey. Hockey's got to be really tough. Basketball's got to be tough because I think they feed on the energy of the of the fans. Not going to have that. It, 
How, how are they keeping motivated? Well, I think, I think a, a lot is lost. I mean, th- th- look, th- these guys are competitors and they want to win. They, they, they would compete if they were in a schoolyard. But there's no question that when there's a crowd there, when there's a home crowd there yelling and screaming, that that, that pushes the player to, you know, the player's adrenaline rush and, and causes them to, to, to play harder. That's why home teams win most of the games in, in every sport. But, but without the crowds, they're still motivated. They still want to win. It's just not mm-hmm. as exciting. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, I, I've talked to a handful of our players about, you know, this, this topic, and obviously they're like, it's really super weird, particularly the first few games. But so once the game starts, they could kind of forget that they were, uh, you know, they were they were there, except when there was big moments and no noise. Of course, there's times where, like, I'm sure Jerry's been through it, like you have a particular player, I won't mention any of our guys in name, but who swing too often to begin with. And they walk up with two men on base in the eighth inning and the crowd's going nuts. And you're kind of like, just relax, pretend there's no crowd, Uh just be in the moment. And um, so I don't know. And we'll see, we'll see how it goes this year, but uh, hopefully having, uh, you know, people back in the stands will make it feel more like a real game. Yeah. I hope it, I hope it happens soon because I miss baseball. I, the length of the game doesn't bother me at all. It's just, you can sit there longer and it's just such a relaxing place. Both ballparks are, um, well, Commissioner Seelig used to always say baseball is is the most social sport. And it first time he said it, I didn't really didn't really I didn't really absorb it. But then I realized it is. It's the one it's the one game you can take your grandparents or your grandkids and you and it's the game you go to when you want to talk to the person you're with. Like right. you get mm-hmm. so much more out of out of it than the other sports. There's a lot of a lot of noise, a lot of things going on, and it's very enjoyable. But baseball is is the game you go to with your buds and um or your family and uh and hopefully we'll get that back this year be great um hey, some somebody, of the just, somebody just sent me this is off the subject but somebody just sent me a text it says a news reporter asked michael jordan if he thought the 90s bulls could beat lebron's lakers jordan said yes the reporter said by how much michael said two or three points the reporter said why such a close call michael said well most of us are almost 60. <laughs> I don't think we can let's end on that one guys um, thank you very much for joining us this has been I think it's been a lot of fun for me hope you found it interesting Tom I'm happy to hear that the, the election over the family can have a Thanksgiving dinner where nobody's throwing right. food at each other we can gather again that's nice yeah mm-hmm. well I look forward to getting together with both of you again and smoking cigars and having a couple of pops and talking about baseball. It's always fun. Thanks so much. We enjoy, at Wintrust, all of us enjoy the partnership we have with you. Um, and uh, Chicago's bank, we're, we're, uh, we intend on, on keeping that. And um, I like to say, as Northwestern found out, and we're waiting for Nepal, but good things happen when you hang with Wintrust. So <laughs> thanks to both of you very much for, for being with us. And again, I look forward to getting together with you in person. Great. Thanks. Stay safe. Stay safe. Yeah, you guys all stay safe. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Okay.